Well, good afternoon. I'm here with uh, Kevin uh, Gallagher, um, and he's the author of The Wild Goose Poems. Um, and just to let you know, I've known Kenneth, uh, Kevin for, for many years. Uh, he's a poet, publisher, and political economist living in um, uh, Belmont. And his, um, his wife is Kelly, Theo, and, and his kids are Theo and Estelle. Uh, he has a dog named Rex Roth, and his recent books are Loom, Radio Plows, and Yet It Moves. And he edits Spoke, a fine journal of poetry and poetics, and he's a professor of global development policy at uh, Boston University. His latest book, of course, is The Wild Goose Poems. Welcome, Kevin. Hey, it's, it's so great to be here, and yeah, indeed, we have known each other for a long, a long time, Doug. Uh, I think I think early early 1990s. Uh, I lived in Jamaica Plain and and edited a magazine called Compost at the time, and there were all sorts of uh, small press festivals yeah. and things like that at the Wang Center, et cetera. That uh, that uh, that Sam Cornish and Jack Powers and Danielle Egros George after her after them. Uh, so yeah, we've known each other a long time, and it's great to great to t uh, have the chance to talk to you about my new book of poems. I'm wearing my Celtics hat. Uh, okay. I know that this is uh, going to be on YouTube, but uh, at the moment of this interview, the Celtics mm -hmm. are, are down two games to one uh, mm -hmm. in the Milwaukee Bucks in the semifinals of this year's so playoff. Here is it. So yeah. uh, I'm in solidarity with them. All right. Well. All right. Well, listen. Um, uh, you. Um, this is uh, this is this collection is inspired by the poet and convict and abolitionist uh, Irish uh, uh, convict. I was going to Australia and he was going to be uh, put in prison. Uh, John Boyle O'Reilly and uh, tells us about the uh, uh, tell us about this guy who is a very uh, eclectic individual to say the least and why he inspires you. You know, I was born in Boston and lived here almost all my life, and I had never heard of John Boyle O'Reilly until I went to the Emigrant Museum in Dublin. Uh, Boston has five sculptures of poets in our city: Phyllis Wheatley, George Burns. I'm, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't. I don't know where that one. Excuse me, Robert Burns. I don't know where that one comes from. <laughs> George, George Burns, Burns is my people. <laughs> He's in Hollywood. Uh, Robert Burns. Edgar Allan Poe, Phyllis Wheatley, and two by John Boyle O'Reilly. Both of them are in the Fens. One of them's uh, over the bridge on the way to Mass Historical Society towards uh, Boylston. And the other one is we keep on going down there. It's right behind the Museum of Fine Arts on, on Hemingway Street. So O'Reilly was a Irish Fenian uh, uh, born, in, born in Ireland. And he, and he saw the Irish numbers as too low and so he said, hey, I'll uh, infiltrate the British and uh, we'll, we'll take him over from within. Well, he had big ideas, but that's not an easy task. And he was immediately put in some of the harshest prisons in, in, in Great Britain and in the United Kingdom, all of which he almost escaped from. And so they said, hey, this guy's too dangerous. And they shipped him to Wales like they did at the time in Australia. But the guy just never gives up. Uh, life imprisonment in Wales isn't going to hold him back. He swims out, gets on a New Bedford bound whaling boat. And by the mid 1800s, he's the editor of the Boston Pilot, which was one of the biggest dailies at the time. Uh, and he had fully immersed himself in being a Bostonian and American and had sort of passed off on Fennyism and, and uh, British neocolonialism and, and focused on abolitionism, actually. And mm -hmm. um, is supposedly John Kenneth. Uh, excuse me, John Ken Kennedy's favorite poet. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, yeah. He wasn't alive at the time, so we had to go for Robert Frost. Better than Robert, Robert Frost. Frost. I was going to say Robert <laughs> Frost. Yeah. So that's uh, John Boyle O'Reilly. And he, on, on the boat, this guy, he was also a poet the whole time. Well, he was a mad revolutionary and uh, not mad, but uh, uh, ambitious. And on the boat from Great Britain to Australia, him and a couple of the other slaves or, you know, or prisoners created a little magazine called The Wild Goose. And, uh, and so that's why this book is called The Wild Goose, because um, uh, it's my little magazine of explorations about my Irish history and, and, uh, and living there and uh, 
for a little while in 2018 and 2019. I was a poet in residence at the Heinrich Boll Cottage. Heinrich Boll is a German uh, novelist, of course, but uh, when he won the Nobel Prize, he it was sort of like he was Bob Dylan and people were lining up all or, uh, away from his place and in, in, in Germany. And so he got a little cottage on the furthest Western end of Europe in Ackle Island and uh, wrote a bunch of books out there, uh, including The Clown, which is uh, one of his most famous ones. And now it's a, uh, a, a writer's retreat right on the ocean. Uh, and, uh, and his legacy goes on there. So that's where I wrote a lot of these poems was, was there. And also staying with a, a poet who we've both known for a long time in the house of Kevin, Kevin and Leslie Bowen. So this is my little magazine of that experience, The Wild Goose. Okay, Kevin Bowen uh, ran the uh, Joiner Center, right? Uh, yeah. The yeah. William Joiner Center, yeah. Yes, he did. Um, you, um, your your first poem, "Birth of a Nation," is uh, based on Irish myth. It's a very sensuous poem about Ethlin and Cain, and uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, can tell us about this couple and how this ties into the title, The Birth of a Nation. Sure. Well, uh, well, Ireland was was ruled by this warlord named Baylor. Um, and it is said that uh, one of his eyes was was winched shut. But when he opened it, everything turned to stone or died uh, when he opened it. And so he always kept it kept it closed. But his warriors were always pillaging pillaging the land and he had a lot of power um but um but uh but this young man uh, uh over overthrows him and this poem is the is how this young man gets born and uh Lutna. and so um uh, i'll read the poem if i could be my guest sure it tells the story a, a little bit more birth of a nation okay. You know, not, not to be confused with the movie, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. Birth of a Nation. Ethlin smelled love in the sea, saw sex when she looked at the sun, and when she rested her eyes at night, she sensed love in her dreams. Her father, Baylor, made the Danaan pay up one third of all their grain, one third of all their milk and one child of every three to feed his greed and army. A, Druim told, a druid told him he would die by the hand of his grandson. So he locked up his only child, Ethlin, in a lonely tower guarded by 12 warrior women, all sworn to never mention or ever let Ethlin see a man. She heard songs come from the sea that none of her guardians could make out. Whenever she heard them, she felt birds beating in their wings in her chest. Too soon, Ethlin was fully grown, mature, and beautiful. She wanted her full breast to be kissed. She wanted to fill her empty womb. She was so alone in her tower. Baylor wanted to feed his power, so he turned Ethlin into a boy and stole Chion's favorite cow. Chion went to Byrog, the she-druid, who disguised Chion as a woman and blew him high off to Baylor's Island, where he landed safely at the foot of Ethlin's tower. Byrog spelled the guardians to sleep, and Chion was to look for his cow. But standing before him was the most stunning woman he had ever seen or dreamed of. He turned right back into a man. As Chion stared at her, Ethlin's whole body went warm. She now, saw, she now saw what she only heard. She now had what she only dreamed of. They each declared their love for each other in the same breath, then gently took off the other's clothes before they could breathe another. He buried his face in her breasts as she put him between her thighs and sang a long, slow psalm of love up into the skies. Chion wanted to live with her forever, but Baylor knew he would kill him. Byrog blew him another wind. Chion left, but he left behind a son. So that's uh, that's the that's, that's the, the birth of the nation, right? 
and I didn't know that mythical story. And I, I, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a great one. You know, Martha Collins, our fine poet here, uh, she opined that um, you started with our Irish myth and then uh, made the myth of your own life. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, we all make myths of our own lives. We have to, you know, essentially lives are chaotic and we have to have some myths, some structure. Well, I wonder if you can comment on that. Yeah, yeah, the book sort of has four, uh, four sections. The first one is sort of engagement with Irish mythology and the Irish stories and all the way up through the British colonialism and the, and the mm -hmm. famine, et cetera. Um, and then it has a section, which is just what I call the journals of John Boyle O'Reilly, which are a number of poems, uh, monologues uh, based on his story. And then the third section is me growing up around here um, as, a, as an Irish American, even though I'm only a quarter of that, I'm a quarter also a descendant of the first servant on the Mayflower and I'm half Italian. And I'm celebrating the half Italian side of me today, actually, because it's Mother's Day. And my mother's the half Italian part, not the Gallagher part. Her name was Guglielmetti. But, um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the fourth part is, um, is called The Rose in the Elysian Fields, which is uh, explore, exploration through the Elysian Fields um, uh, from Aeneid, of course, and Virgil. But... Um, uh, but it's a it's an engagement with my father who who uh, uh, sort of searching for my father in the way in the way that uh, that hero does uh, okay. in, in that epic and, and engaging him with him there. So those are the sort of four parts of the uh, of, of the book. And yeah, it sort of creates the, the myth or helps me construct the myth of of my of my own space, I guess, as you say. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I got to. Um... I got a kick out of the <laughs> one of your poems, uh, "The Death of the Two Toilet Irishmen." Is oh. that, if you had two toilets, was that like you were like a lace curtain Irish or? Yeah, yeah, it? that one's that one's about Martin Faraday out in uh, what's now Jamaica Plain, out by the the old Forest Hills up on Astaku Street. Uh, yeah, if you could get two toilets in in your house, you were that was like a status status symbol. I guess I'm not a stone of status, but, uh, uh, but anyway, um, I like, you know, in these 14 stanzas, you, you, you sort of like um, do a whole history, sort of Irish American history of a lot of immigrants who came over and maybe you could talk a bit about that. Yeah. Well, as I said, that, that is the story, a great story about uh, Martin and, and to a certain extent, Mary Faraday. These are two folks who uh, came here from uh, their, their, their families came here from, from Ireland and they settled in this uh you know dirt place and built build two uh two toilets out in out in Jamaica Plain West Roxbury and uh he becomes a butcher and she answers an ad in the Boston Globe that says secretary needed and from like 1961 till 1997 she was the secret secretary for Red Arback. Oh, lucky, wow. lucky lucky me I'm best friends with her with her grandson and you know, my uh, my my wife, my late wife, cared for Al Alabrock and uh, Mass General. She thought he was a re really great guy. But anyway, uh, yeah. we I digress. Um, so yeah, went to went to a bunch of Celtics games uh, on on that time. But that's a that's a sort of and yeah, they're the kinds of things they experienced are what so many other uh, so so many ones. He was also a World War II vet um, who uh, you know just lived the sort of uh, the great American. Uh, uh, you know, the great American migration prize that not many people win anymore, but uh, mm -hmm. came here, worked hard, got himself a place. Him and his wife uh, have kids. They go to college, have their own families. Hey, he, he didn't Lots he have a market? He, 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 he had a, he, he opened a market. Uh, yes, yeah. I, I name it in the poem. I could read the poem. Yeah. Uh, I'm clicking around for it here. I forget the name of the market. Uh, forgive me, Sean. Before we get to that, I just wanted to ask you because I've known Paul Marion for a long time, and we've reviewed his books. And you know, his emphasis used to be on, um, well, it still is, I imagine, in French American literature. Uh, and um, is he? He's a good guy to work for, I imagine. And uh, 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 are you part of the new um, direction he's going into, or expansion, or 
I can't speak for his, the vision. Yeah. He's a terrific guy. And, and, and I, I have, I've known him uh, since the early nineties too, but when loom press was, has been going on for, for a long time, it's a strong presence of the sort of Lowell Merrimack area um, uh, community, which I, I would say, I think the press, if that is really what it focuses on is that whole experience and, and, and that whole community. And so there are some, they have, they published a book a, a year ago of, uh, photographs of, in Ireland. Um, they also uh, publish uh, all sorts of uh, all sorts of po poetry and, and essays about about that about that region and folks who are from there. And and um, my father's from up there, and this book is sort of uh, sort of uh, from him. Um, that's sort of a connection. And and I I had known Paul many many years ago in the 1990s, but it wasn't until 2016 when I published a book called Loom, ironically the same same as his press, um, which is really all about the, the, the sort of, uh, it's a story taking place in the, in Lowell and Lawrence, at least part of it, and sort of telling that story and the story of Amos A. Lawrence, who, uh, who uh, in addition to naming a town after himself, um, or his father had anyway, uh, really, really became pivotal in American history after seeing how terrible we, uh, we treated uh, fugitive slaves here in the city of Boston. Okay. And, um, oh yeah, read a few poems from your, from your collection, uh, whatever you yeah. choose. That'd be great. Sure, uh, well, let's hear the two toilet Irishmen first. Two toilet, I'll good. start with the, the death of a two toilet Irishman. This is a, it's a Martin Faraday, 1915 to 2012. I read this one for, for right. Pat Cran on Mother's Day. All right. Don't mourn these men, God. Excuse me. Don't mourn these men, thank God they were alive, Patton said in a speech in Copley Square. His father dead, O'Higgins too, Churchill's gold mistake also left the subject screwed. His mother came to Biddy on Beacon Hill and Mary worked ships on Four River until war called him to fight with Patton's Super Six. He found himself at the Battle of the Bulge. He broke the clock for good at Buchenwald Skeletons with white skin coats and some hope tried to lift their heroes on their shoulders, but they were all at the end of their ropes. No Irish need apply signs were gone when he came back. He got himself a job at First National as a meat cutter. He met Mary, had a girl and two boys. He bought the family into a triple decker on Astaku Street in Jamaica Plain. Mary answered an ad when the kids grew that simply read, Secretary needed. She worked 13 championships for Red while Marty toasted the television set. He saved up to open Walk Hill Market and become a two toilet Irishman in West Roxbury and later the Cape. There he loved family, history, the quarter deck. He declares all your power to the next, your mighty axed to all who are to come. Sorry about the alarm going off. I guess it's time for me to wake up. <laughs> no problem. Uh, what else do you like to read? Uh, by the way, you, you said you do have some uh, readings coming up. Um, I do have some readings coming up. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to go back to JP and read in the, um, in the Loring Greeno House reading series. That's going to be next Friday the 13th. Friday the 13th poetry reading. Unfortunately, because we have a little bit of a spike up here, that one's going to be on Zoom. The following Thursday, it's like to meet folks in, in person if they want to join. The Gloucester Writer Center is, uh, is actually going to hold their reading at the moment at the Rocky Neck Community Center out on Rocky Neck. Uh, and I'll be reading with, um, uh, forgive me if I, if I spell it wrong, uh, uh, name wrong, uh, Mary, excuse me, pronounce her name wrong, uh, Mary from the uh, the president of New England Pres uh, Poetry Club. Uh, Mary uh, Bushinger Bodwell. Bodwell. Yeah. Yes. Bush yeah, say it one more time. Mary Bushinger Bodwell. Mary Bushinger Bodwell. So I'll be reading with her on, on uh, May 19th. Are you connected with the New England Poetry Club? You know, on and off, I've been a, a mem member since the, since the 1980s. I knew Victor House. Uh, him and, and Joseph DeRoche uh, were, uh, were uh, better friends with Joseph. Um, 
but uh, I knew Victor and Victor was the, was like, uh, you know, one of the treasurers or something like that for, for years and years. So uh, I, I, another poem I'll read, um, we'll call it uh, British Clearance Song, 19th century. What use can fa small farmers possibly be? That lazy root that grows in lazy beds is grown by you lazy people. For every one of you, I'm charged a fee, but none of you pay anything to me. It is time for me to set you free. I won't be breeding paupers anymore. I clear you from your land and burn your roof. I turn potato beds into pasture. I hand the land back to Protestant Scots. I weed out the idle and the dishonest. I sweep you to the embraces of death. I cut down the exuberance of your tree. If you dare survive, I bury you alive. British Clarence. Uh, I'll read one of the uh, one of the poems of the sequence of John Boyle O'Reilly. This is him in a sketch that he made. He was very into being fit. This is him boxing, uh, boxing behind. He died fairly young, but that was. He did. Uh, I think in in his fifties. Um, okay. Absconder to the attention of all British colonies, eighteen sixty nine. John Boyle O'Reilly, registered 9843, imperial convict, arrived in the colony per convict ship, Ugamont, in 1868. Sentenced to 20 years, 9th of July, 1866. Description, healthy, appearance, present age, 25 years, 5 feet, 7 and a half inches, high, black hair, brown eyes, dark complexion and convicted Irishman. Dangerous, conniving, untrustworthy, revolutionary and against the crown. Absconded from Convict Road Party, Bunbury, 18th of February. Read, uh, let me just read, uh, I'll read, I'll read one more. Sure. Those summer Saturdays. Saturdays too, my dad woke up early, put on his grass stained Sperry topsiders, his green Bermudas with paint stains and whales, then took the entire day to mow the lawn. He'd snap open and fire up his Zippo, then mow two perfect rows with a Salem menthol 100 shrinking from his mouth. Time to take a break for a Miller Lite to turn up Ken Coleman for the sock score, to shout it out for everyone to know. He'd save the empty cans to be redeemed, then light another butt for two more rows. One lawn, three packs, and a case in a day. And what did I know? What did I know? Wow. All those things, you know, the, the, the Zippo and the, you know, the beer, the, all those things, you know give us the you know sort of the essence of the fog yeah thank you and that's that's actually a a, a lifted riff on um on robert hayden mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he has a he has a poem a wonderful poem about his father uh called uh, those winter sundays yeah and, uh I was in church uh, with with my with my dad during during sundays but uh, this is what he would do on saturday what did he do your father was he uh, what did he, do? Yeah. Uh, he did all sorts of stuff. Uh, I guess his, his longest thing is he worked at Pittsburgh Plate Glass uh, once in first in Boston and then in Westboro and then out in Hartford, Connecticut. I lived uh, right outside of Hartford, Connecticut for for uh, for about a decade. Um, and uh, and my mother was a school teacher, a, a chemistry teacher at some Catholic schools there and then Weathersfield High School, which is also right outside of, of Hartford. Would you, did your mother see this manuscript at all before uh, she passed? You know, I told her about it and she knew about the fellowships in, in, in Heinrich Boll. Um, and uh, I've read her some of the poems and I told her it was being published, but um, 
Uh, and I was telling her the story about it because when she was really close to the end there, I was spending, you know, almost every day with her. And when I was running back or when she was taking naps, I was actually doing the proofs for the book because uh, the book's just come out now. Here we are in, in May. Um, but obviously, as you know, in, in January, December is when Paul Mary and the publisher and I were uh, going back and forth on, on, you know, testing the cover and all that kind of stuff. So uh, she has, she has, hasn't seen it in her hand and in, in her hands, but she, she felt her pre the presence of it, which was, which was great. I would have loved for her to, to actually be able to see the thing, but, uh, but uh, wasn't in the cards. Wasn't you know, it. if I was to ask you the final question, if I was to ask you, why should we read this book? Um, what would you say? Yeah, I wouldn't read, you know, this is my first book I've ever written sort of about me. Um, but it isn't about me. It's a, uh, it's a bunch of stories um, that, um, that have moved me to move the language. And so, um, so I think there's a lot in it for, there's a lot of history in here of Boston and things that are controversial, uh, the, the, the parades and, and, and dealing with uh, uh, newer generations of, of immigrants and uh, but there's also an exploration of Irish myth and history, like the one that uh, the one that I read, The Birth of a Nation. There's a number of others there that deal with those myths. And then there's a, a monologue about John Boyle O'Reilly, who not many poets, not many people know about here in Boston. And so I think it's it's fun. Hopefully parts of it are are lyrical and, and hopefully get you to that to that next point. But uh, you can learn something and feel something at the same time. Uh, I hope at its best is what uh, is what uh, is what the reader can can get out of it. Well, I want to thank you for being on Poet to Poet, Writer to Writer, Kevin, um, and best of luck in your endeavors. Thanks so much, Doug. Great to see you. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Okay.